and I covered part one of a message discussing New Testament scriptures that traditional Christianity will use to say that the law has been nailed to the cross or that the law has been done away. Uh, today I want to cover part two of that. I've got another part two that uh, goes with another message that we'll get to at some point in the future, but not today. So I apologize uh, for uh, having to jump into the middle with so many people who were gone, and you missed probably what was one of the one of the best sermons I've ever given in my, my life or ever will give. No, it was a regular sermon, but we covered, we covered some of the basics uh, that we see in Acts 15 of the Jerusalem conference where uh, it was talked, uh, where some have used that passage to say that there are only a certain number of things that folks need to do now. Uh, they don't need to necessarily keep the law. They just need to do these, these several things. We covered that passage. We covered uh, a couple of passages in Romans, Romans 6 and Romans 7. And what I want to do is continue that today. We started the study. Let's turn to Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel, if we would, to begin today. We started the study, the, uh, the study, I guess it was more of a study than it was a, a sermon, but we started it talking about uh, a subject that we've discussed before about this man of lawlessness that's going to come on the scene, the one whom we understand to be the false prophet, the the, uh, in some respects, called the, the little horn in Revelation 13 uh, that, that, that comes up, or another, another horn, this individual who is the son of perdition that has the mystery of lawlessness, and that lawlessness will abound uh, in the end time, and, and because of its abounding, the love of many will wax cold, as we covered in Matthew 24. I'd like to build on that today as we get to a few of the other scriptures to wrap up this discussion of, of uh, passages that we want to cover. We, we recognize that and if it doesn't take much to just look out in society and to see if we're grounded in the God's word at all, to see the degree of lawlessness that is, is becoming more and more pervasive in our society here, uh, let alone in Europe and in other uh, Western uh, cultures especially. We see that, we see it every day, and it sickens us, frankly. It saddens us and it sickens us. Uh, but it is the nature of things. It's part of what we look look to and see in terms of crying and sighing for the, the sins and the abominations that are going on uh, around us. It's, it's very disheartening to see that, but at the same time, we see Scripture says it's got to happen. And, and we want to read, to begin today, just another passage that speaks to that. Like, like we said last time, we covered uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 to introduce it. I'd like to pick up in Daniel 7 uh, today. Some of you are ahead of me in this, but prophetically, we see there's, there's an image uh, talked about at one point, and then in Daniel 7, we, we see these four beasts uh, that, will, that, are, that represent world powers, and then finally come down to this fourth beast. Let's look at it here. Daniel, Daniel 7, verse 4, there's this uh, lion that had eagle's wings who was plucked, so to stand on feet like a man, we understand that to be the Babylonian Empire. Secondly, there was another beast, a second like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth. Uh, that was the Medo-Persian Empire. And then we see the, the four divisions of the Greco-Macedonian Empire uh, led by Alexander the Great in, what, 330-something, 332, 331 B.C. After this, I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had its on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads uh, after he died that separated into four different groups, uh, four different regions within the, uh, the Greece, Grecian Empire. And then we come to verse 7. And then I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth, and it was devouring. It was breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the ten horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. 
we understand that, that passage to talk about that final, that final beast, that final fourth kingdom represented by the Roman Empire that has its ten resurrections, its ten sections. Uh, in the first three, the Vandals, the Heruli, and, and the Ostrogoths, Ostrogoths, we add after them uh, the things being brought back together here and, and not only the, the uh, Roman Empire, but also the papacy came into to that uh, with this fourth, this fourth resurrection or this fourth uh, iteration of, of this beast. And that is uh, the combining of church and state, the combining of the Roman Empire with the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church, uh, creating this, this marriage, uh, so to speak, of church and state and the Holy Roman Empire then has its seven, its seven iterations. The last one, the tenth one, is yet to come. So he says uh, this, this, uh, this little horn, though, comes up uh, in that, and we understand that to be this little horn, at least in, in this uh, passage here at the end of verse 8, to some degree is talking about the, the bringing of the Roman Empire together into this Holy Roman Empire and the papacy it, itself and the church itself is represented by this, this little horn. Well, uh, little horn as the papacy all the way throughout and then finally at the very end, we've got a, an individual that is, is in a sense that little horn, that final representative of the, of the Roman Catholic Church that gives that power uh, to the beast and, and helps support the beast with all its incredible, uh, all of his incredible miracles that he's able to perform. So he says in verse 9, I watched till thrones were put in place and then the Ancient of Days was seated. This, uh, the Ancient of Days, uh, garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, wheels burning fire, uh, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand, that's one hundred million, uh, stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. Verse, verse 11, I watched them because of the sound of this, these pompous, these arrogant words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As we get into the rest of the chapter, Daniel uh, talks about this, uh, these four great beasts. He was grieved in his heart, verse 15, just trying to figure out all, all this and, and wanted to know the interpretation. So it says uh, what the four uh, great beasts were in verse 17 and, and saying that ultimately in verse 18, the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom. They'll possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, this one that was exceedingly dreadful, as we had read about before, uh, and, and until the Ancient of Days comes in verse 22 and, and sets that up. Verse 23, this fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from uh, the first ones and, and shall subdue the three kings. Again, speaking of these, these uh, resurrections of, of the empire, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High and shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. It's very important uh, for us to recognize that statement. Uh, one of the things as we move towards the end, as we move towards that final resurrection of the Holy Roman Empire with uh, the false prophet that's r running the show in, in terms of lending power to the beast, this individual that runs the beast power, that, that one of the things that are, is, is going to be a, a characteristic of this of this system is the, the intention to change times and laws, the changing of laws. We see uh, in one respect the laws of God that, that through that entity has whittled away or, or in some ways just blasted away the truths of God, the understanding of the commandments of God uh, and, and, and have, has instituted in, in that sense a state of lawlessness. That state of lawlessness will continue to uh, increase and increase. God's people 
Those of us who are grounded in his word and grounded in the understanding of God's law and the intent of the law will we'll keep their eyes open. They'll be able to see this. We'll be able to recognize these subtle changes and sometimes these, these major changes in lawlessness. For, for those of us that are caught up in, in the world and caught up in the, the lifestyle of this whole system of Babylon and not grounded in God's word and not observing our own lives and not observing uh, uh, what, what Scripture says about what is going to be going on, we'll miss that. They'll, they'll not see the degree to which these things are changing and the, that these things represent the opposite of God's way of life. This is a a trademark or a, uh, a marker that, that we as God's people will, can possess and hold on to to see one of the key issues that, that will be represented in this final uh, kingdom, in this final resurrection uh, if I, re, of the Holy Roman Empire, shall intend to change times and laws. Then the saints shall be given into his hand, verse 25, for a time in times and half a time. As we look at that, we think of that in time persecution that happens to the church of God leading up to the return of Jesus Christ. We've got the three and a half years. The, the, the day of the Lord fits within that three and a half years as we're leading up to the return of Christ. But as the fifth seal states, there is, there is persecution and many martyrs who are living God's way of life, the saints that will be martyred during that time. The saints even being given into this individual who intends to change times and law. Scripture also talks about a, a group of people that are taken to her place and nourished for a time, times, and half a time. Not all will be in that situation as he goes, as the dragon goes out to make war with the, the, the rest of her offspring during this time. So it's critical for us to recognize this, this essence that has been in, in position, in place, ever since the Garden of Eden, how, how Satan himself is constantly intent on switching and changing and, and twisting God's word to, to change what God says is, is true and right. And a huge part of that is the respect to God's, to God's law. Look at verse 26. But the court shall be seated, as uh, we read earlier. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume it and destroy it forever. Verse 27, then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. We know this, don't we? We, we know these truths. We know these, and we know that we're to be ever watchful uh, to this. But I want us in, in this second part of the of the series to take a look at these laws, take a look at these laws, the discussion of law in scripture today, to take a look at what traditional Christianity has said has been done away with law, that is in a sense a, a, a testimony to the lawlessness that is out there and that will increase. Are we on guard with that, do we understand some of these passages? It, it'll be a review for for most of us, but do we understand these? Can we defend these? Can we at least understand them from, from the standpoint of of how it makes sense to us what's really being said here? Because these these things are are attacked uh, in terms of our our understanding of God's law. It's attacked by using some of these key scriptures. We won't go to all of them today, but let's uh, jump in now and and get into a few more of these. Uh, I would encourage you to, to, as we talked last time, to do a deep dive, to study some of these. And as you come up on some of, some of these passages that, uh, that folks have used to say, it's, it's nailed to the cross, it's done. We don't need to keep it anymore. I would encourage you to go in and do a deep dive with each one of those. Don't just read over that and say, well, we know this and this. Uh, go to that scripture. Look, look, at the, look into the depth of that scripture. What, what Greek words are being used there? What, what does it tie to? Go to life, hope, and truth. See the other passages that talk about that and, and lend credence to what we understand to be the truth of lawfulness as God's people. Let's pick up, this, pick up the, uh, the story in terms of our scriptures that we want to cover today uh, by going to the book of Galatians. Uh, 
one that I would, had wanted to cover but would not have enough time to go into detail is Romans 10.4. I'll, I'll let you do that one as a study. Uh, a statement that says Christ is the end of the law. What does that mean? What does Christ is the end of the law mean? Uh, just a hint uh, deals with uh, aimed at. It, he, uh, it all ultimately aims at, at Christ is, is one of the Greek words that is the Greek word that uh, could be defined that way. But we won't go into the detail of, of that one. But, uh, but let's, let's go to Galatians. We'll, we'll hit two in Galatians today uh, as we address this subject and, and deal with it in, in fair detail. You can do, of course, a, a much deeper dive, and I would encourage that. Galatians 3, let's, let's look there. Here's a passage that is often uh, interpreted to say that the law has been done away. Galatians 3, verse 1. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did, did you receive the Spirit by works of law or by hearing of faith? Did we receive God's Spirit by the works that we've done in law? Uh, do, by doing the law, does God have to, do we earn re the reception of his Holy Spirit? He says, is that, is that how that works? Or by the hearing of faith? Is it more, though, we, he preached to us, he told us what what. Uh, what what Christ had done for us. He told us about his way of life. He told us about his plan. We, we recognized his plan. We understood it because he opened our, our eyes to it. We yielded to that and we gave ourselves to God in fullness. And, and he gave us this, this great gift uh, through repentance and through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And we believe that it was so that we have received God's Holy Spirit, that we've been forgiven of our sins, and that we have the down payment of eternal life do, do, by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Does, does the flesh now, is, is that something that makes you perfect? Uh, again, likely referencing here circumcision that it is physical circumcision required in order to have uh, received the Spirit. Last time we talked about uh, Acts 10, Cornelius uh, having received uh, the Spirit, uh, uncircumcised, a Gentile, and, and the family. So the, the apostles realized that, it, we, that circumcision in the Old Testament was just a type of the reality of, of what the 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 actual fulfillment of that was, that it's the circumcision of the foreskin of the heart, the, the revealing of the heart, the opening up of the heart to where God can write his laws on our heart, the circumcision of the heart. It, it was a type and a foretaste of what this is, is to be. So here he's talking to Galatians. These are, these are uh, individuals who are primarily Gentiles, and he's saying that to them. Verse 4, have you suffered so many things in vain for, for no purpose, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and now works miracles among you, does he do it by works of law uh, or, or by the hearing of faith? The, the, like Abraham, he believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Was, was it through that or, or was it by works of law? I have done this and this and this, so God must give this to me now. Uh, Verse 7, therefore know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. Ultimately, spiritually, part of the body of Christ, part of the seed of Abraham, it comes through uh, faith, faith of God, faith, faith in God, faith of, in Jesus Christ's sacrifice and what's been done for us. Verse 8, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham before saying, he said, reflect back, remember what he said to Abraham? In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So now, verse 10, we come to the, the issue of what uh, folks would say is done. I'll just read it, and then we'll come back and address it. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it's written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. 
Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So what, what folks have said, uh, traditional Christianity, is, okay, we've got faith over here, and we've got works of law over here. Uh, Works of law, we've been redeemed from uh, the works of law because the law is a curse for us. Uh, it is a curse to us. So we've been redeemed from that. So now it's, it's all about faith. And if we have faith, if we believe in, in God and if we believe in Jesus Christ, then therefore we are, we are his. Is, is, that, is that what it's saying? I think most of us are, are very familiar with this passage, but let's go through it again and, and get to the essence of, of what is being discussed. Verse 10, for as many as are of works of law, as is technically, there's no article in the Greek is there for that, but for as many as are works of law, sometimes that's referred to deeds of law as well in other scriptures, uh, are under the curse for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Okay, keep your finger there. Let's go uh, back to Deuteronomy 27 where he says this. Remember, remember Israel is there. Uh, they're, they're standing. They're, he splits, splits, God splits them into their, their two groups. Uh, half Half basically are over at Mount, Gebal, uh, Mount Ebal, and the other uh, are at Mount Gerizim, as this is being prophesied. Deuteronomy 27, Deuteronomy 27, so he, he sets them up there. The law, uh, verse, verse 1, uh, the law is inscribed on these stones. Keep all the commandments which, which I, I give you this day. Uh, it shall be on the day when you cross over to Jordan. Uh, he's, he's going to uh, you'll have these stones with, that, that have all of this written on it. So he says in verse 10, Therefore you shall obey the voice of the Lord your God and observe his commandments and his statutes which I command you today. So then he starts pronouncing these curses. Uh, Moses commanded the people on that day saying, uh, so here, Mount Gerizim, folks stand there to bless the people uh, when you cross over. And then we've got uh, uh, the Gerizim Ebal situation. So uh, Levites were involved. Here, here's, here's the first one, uh, verse 15. Cursed is the one who makes a, a carved or molded image. Cursed, an abomination to the eternal. Uh, and all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed is that person. Cursed is the one who treats his father or mother with contempt. Uh, and all the people shall say, Amen. So be it. We agree. We, we accept that statement. Cursed is the one who moves his neighbor's landmark. Cursed is the one who makes the blind to wander off the road. Cursed is the one who lies with his father's wife. Cursed is the, uh, is, is, uh, the, the the one who lies with his sister, all the different uh, sexual sins there. Cursed is the one who attacks his neighbor secretly, verse 20, 24. Uh, now we come to verse 26. Cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law, and all the people shall say amen. So if, if the person is cursed for, uh, for that sin, as we come back to Galatians 3, then what, what's the curse? Is the curse the law? Is that, is that the curse? What is the curse? The curse is, is not the law. The, the curse is the, the penalty for breaking the law. The curse for be, breaking the penalty of the law is death. Verse 10, for as many who are, as are of works of law, if, if, I, if, if my whole belief system is set up on if I do this, 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 and this and keep this law perfectly, then I shall live by that. Uh, if, that is that, if that is my foundation, then as I break that, I experience the curse of that, and the curse of that is death. Uh, it's not saying that the law itself is, is a curse, but the, 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 the result of that is the curse. Verse, uh, verse 11, so 
so he says here in verse 11, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God. We talked about justification last time. Justification means declared righteous or rendered innocent. Nobody can be rendered innocent by, by the law, by works of law. That only happens through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That only happens by his, uh, his, his blood covering our sins. Yet, so it says here, no one is, is declared righteous or rendered innocent by the law in the sight of God. It, that, that, it's evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the, the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. That, that's, you know, if, if, if it's all about the law and I must keep the law perfectly, it is my life and, my, and death. If, if, that is, if I am under that, if I am under that law, then I then if I break that law, I'm, I'm under the penalty of it. I'm under the curses that come with the law. Uh, and one of the purposes of the law is to condemn us for sin. So as Romans 7 talks about, I, I fall under that curse, and that curse is death. Uh, but, but, but he says here that Christ has redeemed us from that. He's redeemed us from the curse of the law. Jesus, through his sacrifice, had to do this. We remember Hebrews 10.1. I'll turn there. You don't have to turn there. But Hebrews 10.1 reminds us, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. The law can't do it. It cannot do it. Uh, what does that is, is the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So he's redeemed us, verse 13, from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. He who had no sin willingly said, I will take on that curse. I will become the curse. I will become sin for you. And it, for it's, as written, verse 13, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. You, 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 have, you put someone to death. He is cursed for his sins. He's put up and, and hung on a tree and everybody sees that curse, and that, that person is left under there and left up there, and they're looking and they're saying, that person is cursed. Jesus Christ became that for us. He became the curse that we should have paid uh, for the actions that we committed under law. He became that curse for us uh, so that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, as it says here, continuing that in Christ Jesus we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Do you and I believe that? Do, of course we believe that. We get that. We understand that. But the, the nature of the lawless one is to twist that, uh, to take it in a direction of saying that the law is the curse and not the curse of breaking the law is death. Get it? Got it good? We got that? Okay, let's go on to the next one then. Let's go to Galatians 4. This is a, a second one that is often uh, brought out that I think bears uh, some discussion. Galatians 4, verse 9. Galatians 4, verse 9. Galatians 4, 9. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you, lest I've labored for you in vain. So traditional Christianity, you look up commentaries, different commentaries will, will state that it's speaking of... Uh, the various days that were kept that Paul was trying to tell the Gentiles they didn't need to keep these days any longer. They didn't need to keep the Sabbaths. They didn't need to keep the holy days. They didn't need to keep uh, the or, or even count for the, the festival seasons and all of that. Uh, it's no longer done uh, in, in force. It is, it is all done away. It's, it's all about faith uh, in, in, in God uh, through Christ. As, as heirs of his promise. Is that, is that what it's saying? That's, it's used often. Let's, let's think about a couple of things with this. Whom was he addressing? He was addressing Gentiles. What's the problem with that uh, premise uh, of, of, of what traditional Christianity would say with verse 10 saying 
that he's doing away with the need to observe uh, Sabbath days, annual Sabbaths, uh, seasons, you know, spring feast season, uh, week, feast of weeks season, uh, fall holy day season. What's the problem with that? Well, one of the problems is if, if, the, if, if the Galatians were primarily Gentiles, how do they, as he says here, uh, but now after you've known God or, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to these? Well, they didn't keep these in the first place. They, they, were, they were Gentiles. They weren't keeping uh, the, the year of ju- ju- Jubilee. They weren't keeping the, the, uh, the uh, seven-year release. They weren't keeping the Sabbath. They weren't keeping the holy days. They weren't, weren't keeping any of that. So how, how would it be that he says you're, you're turning back to that again? That, that, makes, that makes no sense. Uh, so they wouldn't have been returning to it. They had never kept them in the first place. The, the Jubilee wasn't being observed anywhere. The sabbatical year, according to uh, Encyclopedia Judaica, uh, Volume 14, w- was not, the sab- sabbatical year was not being observed in areas outside of Palestine. So what's, what's, going, what's going on here? Is he even talking about those kinds of days? Thirdly, uh, in Colossians 2, we'll turn there in a second, uh, but in Colossians 2, it does speak to uh, certain days. It, it talks about uh, Sabbaths, festival, new moon. It talks about uh, some of these, these statements. And very specific terms are used here for festival, Sabbaths, new moons are, are discussed there. In, in here, uh, in, at this passage, back in Galatians, the, they could have, if, if that's what Paul was intending uh, to mean that you no longer keep these days, why did he not use those specific terms for those days? Why is he saying these general terms that, uh, that are supposed to be Sabbaths and, and festivals when he clearly said that to another group of individuals that, was, that were in the Gentile world in, in Colossae? Uh, that, that's a problem. Uh, the, fourth, the fourth area that is a problem is, is coming back to look at verse 9. Let's, let's look at it again. But now after you've known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak? Uh, Greek there uh, can mean powerless, uh, low of the earth, earthy, earthly kinds of things, and beggarly uh, elements, these these poor, uh, bankrupt kind of elements. How is it that you turn again to these weak and beggarly kinds of things? So so, uh, is Paul saying that the law of God, the commandments of God, are, are weak? <laughs> that uh, weak and earthly kinds of things? As, as Romans, Romans tells us, the law is spiritual. God, God kept the Sabbath. He rested and he sanctified and set apart the Sabbath day as, as he refashioned the earth in, in creation week. He, he sanctified the Sabbath. These are my feasts, he says in... in, in uh, in Leviticus 23. And so, so do you think Paul would come back and say, you know, yeah, they were, they were God's feasts, I know, and he said they're his, and he sanctified and set that up. But, you know, really, when you get down to it, they're really earthly, kind of beggarly, weak, and powerless kinds of things. Just totally, totally the opposite of what, what Paul w- would say. So, so what is it, then, that we see here? To what could Paul be referring when, in verse 10, he says, you observe days and months and seasons and years. Well, as we look at the, the context, uh, let's look at verse 3, Galatians 4, verse 3. Even so, we were, when we were children, uh, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. So we see this, this term elements mentioned here. And then we also see it mentioned in, in verse 9, these, this, these weak and beggarly elements. The Greek word uh, there for, for elements is stoichia, uh, S-T-O-I-C-H-E-I-A. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it's, as the Expositor's Bible Commentary mentions this, it would seem that in Paul's time, uh, stoichia actually referred to the sun, S-U-N, moon, stars, planets, 
all of them uh, associated with gods or goddesses, and because they regulated the progression of the calendar, also uh, associated with the great pagan festivals uh, honoring uh, the gods. In Paul's view, these gods were demons. Hence, he would be thinking of a demonic bondage in which the Galatians had indeed been held prior to the proclamation of, of the gospel. How is it that you're returning back to these, these, these weak and, and, and beggarly elements, these elemental things that, uh, you know, Paul's concerned that they may return to these, these previous pagan practices that, uh, to which they came out of, these elements uh, that, are, that are not uh, of God. So, so looking at it then, we see it makes perfect sense for Paul to say in verse 11, I'm afraid for you, lest I've labored for you in vain. Now, we could, we could go to all kinds of scriptures in the book of Acts to talk about the New Testament church in these areas throughout Asia Minor, in these areas throughout the Roman Empire that were keeping the Sabbath, that were keeping the holy days, they were meeting on the Sabbaths, uh, to, to back that up. But just looking at the, the passage itself, we see the, the problems uh, with it. Let's go back to verse 3 again and read that through verse 7. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Jesus Christ. Don't go back into these elements of the world into which you were uh, 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 held captive by. Look to God, look to his ways, look to his truth, look to the, the truth that comes through the sacrifice of Christ and through living a, a, a new life as a new creation, uh, walking in God's ways. Okay, uh, so we have uh, two more to cover, and I'll cover this one really, really briefly. Just encourage you to, to do a study on this one yourself, because it's a uh, it's, it's pretty neat uh, study to, to look at it, but I'll just cover it. Quickly, it's in Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 is a big uh, passage uh, that they hit, often uh, saying that he's ab abolished the commandments. Ephesians 2, we, we covered this three or four years ago in, in a message. And I know most of us, I think, are aware of this. But Ephesians 2, verse 14, ta he talks about this whole subject of uh, in verse 11, remember, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were, you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth. The, the uncircumcised, the Gentiles were aliens from the commonwealth, uh, from, from Israel. They were without, they didn't have the covenants, they didn't have, they were without God in the world. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's a matter of faith to believe that, and they had seen witness. Uh, they had witnessed that with uh, with the the conversion of the Gentiles. Verse fourteen: For he may, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one. So there, there's the circumcision, and then there's the un uncircumcision, the Gentiles and the Jews. And, and he's saying, I've made them both one, as, as Galatians talks about, neither Greek nor Jew nor Gentile, but we're all a part of the body of Christ. We're all a part of that now through God's Holy Spirit. But he says here, have a, but he's abolished in his flesh the enmity. Well, what's the enmity? That is the law of commandments. So is our commandments the enmity? Is that what he's getting at? Uh, law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, so that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the, through the cross. So he, he broke, this, broke down this middle wall of separation, and some would see that as uh, circumcision and the law. All of that is, is, the, is the wall that separates. So we break down the law, we get rid of the law, and now Jews and Gentiles all come together in the body of Christ 
uh, as, as the church, and we no longer need the, the wall uh, uh, that separated them, which was the law itself. Uh, is, is that what's going on? Well, as, as we know, uh, I'll, again, I'll let you read into that in more, more detail, but there was a wall in, in Paul's day that, that actually came down uh, with the, the fall of Jerusalem in, in 70 AD, but there was a wall that the Jews had erected, uh, creating an outer court, uh, which was for the Gentiles, and an inner court, which was for the Jews. So in this wall, uh, that, that they had uh, erected and set up in that area was not to be crossed over by a Gentile. He could not go into that area of the Jew, where the Jews could go, which was closer to the holy place and then ultimately with the Holy of Holies. But they couldn't cross that. Where in Scripture does it talk about that wall uh, being uh, that, that they needed to form that wall in the, in the, the building of the tabernacle, in the building uh, of the temple? Where is that covered? It was not covered. It was not in there. It was not in uh, the Old Testament to build this, this wall. Uh, men had decided in their desire to protect, of, of, following, of following God, their desire was in, to do that. They created, in a sense, this hedge separating them from Gentiles so that Gentiles could not come through that. Well, when we look at the context here, it, it makes perfect sense. He, he's, he's saying there is this wall that's been here that was erected by man. It was not erected by God. God set up a, a plan for aliens and, and others, uh, strangers who came in and wanted to adopt God's way of life to become part of, of Israel in that respect and, and, and be, a, 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 in a sense, convert to uh, the, the teachings of, of, of what ancient Israel w was keeping. They had that opportunity to do that. They, mankind, uh, Israel had set up this wall to, to keep this, this separation between Jews and Gentiles. It wasn't, wasn't listed in Scripture to set it up this way, uh, but they had done so. And he's saying, and it had created tremendous enmity uh, between is, uh, Israel and, and uh, Gentiles. He's saying... Christ's sacrifice, and of course we see the, the situation of Cornelius and others, the Gentiles coming to the faith, in, in a sense tears down that middle wall of, of separation. It doesn't matter what race we are uh, with respect to the body of Christ, with respect to being children of Abraham. It, we are connected through the seed of Abraham, connected through Jesus Christ and through his Holy Spirit. So in verse 22, in whom you are all being built together for a dwelling place in God and the Spirit not talking about doing away with the law at all, but, but this middle wall of separation that was built by men, uh, these law of commandments and ordinances. Co law of commandments and ordinances can sometimes mean God's law, or sometimes it can be man-made laws. In this case, it's uh, the, uh, the man-made law that was, was an enmity between those folks. Okay, one last one. Let's go to Colossians 2. Colossians 2, as we uh, begin to wrap this up today. There are uh, a couple of more, but uh, these are some of the main ones that we, we want to address. Colossians 2, we'll start in verse 4, breaking into the thought. I won't go uh, spend a, a lot of time in verses uh, 16 and 17. Mr. Franks has talked about that uh, several times in, in recent messages, speaking of, of the Sabbath, the feasts, that are shadows of things to come. Now, traditional Christianity will say it was just they're, they're way back there, and they were just a shadow. And when Christ came, it just wiped all that out. Well, uh, Mr. Franks has uh, very accurately said uh, multiple times that, that, yes, they are a shadow. They, they, in a sense, foreshadow the plan of God. Uh, the holy days, the seasons, the festivals, they are a shadow. They, they teach us of what is to come. We, we have clarity in terms of the way the future is laid out uh, through the holy days. Very much a, a shadow of that, but we won't go into the detail of that. Okay, so let's go to uh, Colossians 2 verse 4. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. Paul says, for though I'm absent in the flesh, yet I'm, I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your, you in good order, uh, see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ Jesus. 
As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and have established uh, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Notice verse 8. Verse 8 is critical. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. That becomes very important as we read the last bit of chapter 2 gives context to that. For in him, in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and and you're complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. So now we get into the, the verses that they say show that it's been done away. In him, in Jesus Christ, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. We understand the 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 type of circumcision and what it, what it pictures, the reality of what's our situation now. By putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, uh, in which you were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Our sins, uh, we, we, we died uh, as Christ died. We died and, and were raised a new man as we came up from the watery grave. And you being dead in your trespasses, uh, trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses, or uh, has forgiven you all trespasses. And here's the statement. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So what, what Christianity would say in, in this situation is he, he wiped out all of the, the handwriting of the requirements, all of the law, all of the commandments. He wiped that all away. He took it out. It, it was contrary to us anyway. He nailed it to the cross, and now we no longer need to keep God's law. It's all about uh, believing in Christ and, and having faith in him. So is that what it's said? Is that what's being said here? Verse 14 again. Notice this word wiped out. Uh, the Greek word, uh, well, it can also mean obliterated. But uh, the Greek word here is E-X-A-L-E-I-P-H-O uh, for wiped out. It is always used in scripture in reference to sin. Never is it uh, used in reference to law. Uh, One such passage is Acts 3.19. We won't turn there. But when we see that term of of wiped out, it's it's always tied to, in other places in Scripture, it's tied to this thing of of sin, not the law. Very important. So so what is he, what is he, uh, what is, what context does that give us as we go forward in the verse then? He he obliterates, he, he wipes out the handwriting of requirements. So uh, the handwriting of requirements, what, what are those things? My margin renders head, handwriting of requirements in the inner margin here of the, uh, of the Nelson New King James. It says uh, it is the certificate of debt with its requirements, the, the certificate of debt, the, the record of, uh, of charges against us, the note of guilt. Christ wiped out that. He wiped out that uh, uh, which was contrary to us. Yes, it was contrary to us because for, for breaking those, uh, the, the, re, these, the, the debt that comes with breaking the law is death. Yes, it, yes, it was contrary to us, uh, which was contrary to us. He's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. It's very, the, the, the certificate or the note of indebtedness he nailed to the cross. Just like he became the curse for us, uh, the sin for us, uh, he was nailed to the cross. The certificate of debt was nailed to the cross. We are no longer under that debt, and the debt must be paid, which is our eternal death. He took that on, and, and in his death, he nailed the debt that we owe to the cross. So understanding that, then, we come down to the last part of this as we, as we wrap things up today. Looking at uh, verse 18 verse 18 so he says and this is what in christianity they will say and see they, they want you to keep all these these uh, holy days and these sabbaths and all these things uh, 
Verse 18, let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility, worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Why would it say that? Verse 19, and not holding fast to the head, meaning Jesus Christ, from whom all the body nourished uh, and, and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that's from from God. Verse 20, therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Dogmatizo. Uh, the context here is clear. It, it could mean biblical laws. It could mean man-made regulations. But the context lets us know what which, which it is. Let's read on. Don't t touch. Don't taste. Don't handle. Christianity would say, oh, all these food laws. That's what it's talking about. Uh, verse 22, which all concern with, with, which concern, which all concern things with perish, which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. It doesn't say of God, does it? It says, which which all, concern, uh, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. Uh, the commandments of God are not the commandments of men. The commandments of God are the commandments of God. So he's, he's referencing back this, let no one cheat you uh, of your reward through, through these things that he's teaching. He's referencing back to what we read in verse 8. This, the passage of beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. These, these traditional uh, things of men, the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Verse 23, these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom. Yeah, it looks like, oh yeah, they're taking it to that next step. Ooh, that's a, that, yeah, they're not just saying the laws of God. They're, they're adding this to it and this. And if you're really righteous, if you're really a person of God, you're going to be doing this, this, and this, and this. And he's saying they're, they're adding to these things, fleshly commandments of men that have an appearance of wisdom. This looks extra deep here. Wow, I'd never thought about that. But where is it in Scripture? It's not there. It, it's it's uh, self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, severe treatment or asceticism or something to, to say this, this demonstrates that I'm at this higher level. Uh, and he says, but these are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. The real battle that's going on is uh, of, of committing ourselves fully to God and, and, and following him. How do we know uh, the indulgence of the flesh? How do we understand that? <laughs> well, the carnal mind is enmity against God, and it's not subject to the law of God. It can't be, as, Revel as Romans 8, 7 tells us. Uh, but we are not of the carnal mind. We are of, uh, of the spirit, and, and we understand the spiritual intent of the law, and we love God's law. We love it. And brethren, as you love God's law, as you live God's law, as you understand and as I understand the spiritual nature of the law, we will be hated for it. We'll be hated for it. Are you okay with that? Am I okay with that? that to, be, to recognize that this is a difference that is going to really come to a head down the stretch. It will. It will. Do we stand for the teachings of God? Do we love God's law? Do we, do we worship God and follow his law and, and worship him in spirit and in truth? It will be a marker, just as uh, it says, this, by this shall all men know uh, that they are mine if they have love for one, an one another. The, the love that we have uh, is a love for God and to love our neighbor as ourselves, which encapsulates the entire law, lawful uh, Christians walking to serve their great God. Let's turn finally to Revelation 12. I'm sorry, Revelation 14. As, as we mentioned, we, we didn't even begin to list all of the New Testament passages which reinforce the keeping of God's laws, the Sabbaths, the commandments today. We, we've done that previously. But, but brethren, ask, let's ask ourselves and let's, let's do a an inventory again of the degree to which we love God's law, the degree to which we study into God's law and, and worship and, and adore uh, God in, in serving him. Because as scripture says, 
By this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. That was said by John in 90 some AD, 60 some years after Jesus Christ died and supposedly nailed the law to the cross. We know that he did not nail that law to the cross. He nailed that penalty and we are so thankful that he nailed the penalty for our sins to the cross. Let's look at another passage in Revelation 14 to conclude. Revelation 14, uh, nestled here in the midst of the prophecy of the 144,000, and then also those who are about to drink of the, of the wrath of God as it's poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation near the return of Christ. Notice what it says as we conclude here in Revelation 14, 12. Does this speak of you and me? May it do so. Here is the patience, or here is the steadfastness, or the perseverance uh, of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus.